What pressures would keep a friend from calling for help even when it was a matter of life and death? In 2005, four fraternity brothers watched and did nothing to help as their close friend, 21-year-old Matthew Carrington, died in front of them. I'll live with the consequences of pain for the rest of my life. My actions killed a good person. Nothing I can say here today will bring back Matthew Carrington or lessen the grief that his family feels. His death was preventable, <laughs> and I will live with the guilt for the rest of my life. Why did these four boys do nothing? Every time I think about it, the feelings rush back, and the idea of what if just stands there in the corner, just not, not leaving. It's always there. I had no doubt that if I would have known what I know now, that I could have stopped it. This story is not unique, but it raises a question. Is there something in human nature that can keep us from helping? Psych one, You're like wow, that is ridiculous. How can someone see something happening that they know is wrong, that they know the person standing next to them knows is wrong, but not take an action? It's sickening to know that I took part in it, that I, that I could have just been the one that stood up. A makeshift memorial of flowers and candles is placed outside the Chi Tau Fraternity House for Matthew Carrington. Police say the 21-year-old Chico State student was in the basement of this house, taking part in a fraternity event at 5 a.m. Wednesday morning when his body gave out. Matt didn't have to die that night. Could have all been so different. Could have all been from the very beginning when they were all down there when there was a room full of guys. It went wrong before they all left. Matthew Carrington joined a fraternity and was undergoing hazing during the spring semester of his junior year. Pledge class 2004. Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And these are our little uh, pledge brothers and shit right here. He wanted to, to join because he, he would get to meet people. He's kind of shy, you know, networking and such when you're older. I mean, you've got brothers and houses in every college all over the country, so. They did some pretty uh, silly things, more embarrassing than causing anybody any harm, like wearing a miniskirt out in the intersection or switching your T-shirt with a homeless guy and putting his shirt on. But it was nothing that was going to get anybody hurt. Oh, how did these seemingly harmless pranks escalate to the point where Matthew died? Basically, it was the third night uh, what the fraternity called Inspiration Week, what the pledges call Hell Week. And the pledges, Mike and Matt, were brought into the basement, and the first thing they did was to undergo some grueling physical calisthenics. The young men were then given a five-gallon water jug, which in itself weighed about 42 pounds, and we're told to stand up on a narrow bench, stand on one foot, and to drink as much as they possibly could. Matthew, at some point, became nauseated, vomited, became increasingly confused. The kidneys can only handle so much water, and indeed, you can poison yourself. When you're drinking water and you're acting drunk, okay, something's not right, you know? When you're slurring your words, when you're, you know, you can't manipulate things like you normally, something's wrong. Gabriel Mastretti and J.P. Fickus came in at some point and they were both intoxicated. Mastretti was excessively intoxicated and they basically took over. Actually, to tell you the truth, I don't remember what most of it. Um, fortunately, I was pretty intoxicated when it happened. I remember making him do push-ups. I don't remember why. Matt was at a point where he couldn't do any more push-ups. He just all of a sudden dropped, and his it just seemed like his whole body just tensed up. You've got, well, at this point, four boys down there. It just makes me sick that they didn't think. 
but they didn't think something's wrong. So why can't someone say stop? What could happen is if one person says, this guy is in real trouble, you call 911, you do this, you do that, everybody will buy that definition, will start to react, uh, will be helpful. The thing is balanced on a knife edge, but sometimes it falls and nothing happens. His hips moved a little bit and he just seized up. And Mike said, uh, oh my God, I think he bit his tongue, and then he said, somebody needs to call an ambulance. I was turning on my cell phone when I was not walking down the stairs and was typing in 911 when I saw a bag at the bottom of the stairs. I had it typed into my phone. All I had to do was press the green button. And he said, it's okay, you don't need to call 911. Matt's just sleeping. You know, I hit, I hit the red button and canceled it out. And he was snoring. It just sounded like he was snoring. I remember that thoroughly. I remember the sound of him snoring. I remember thinking, no, he's sleeping. The snoring was certainly not sleeping. It would have been a result of water intoxication uh, and a pulmonary edema, which is basically the lungs filling with fluid approximately an hour after he had been left to sleep it off. He was not breathing. Do nothing for an hour while they have him lay there. Then they realize he's not breathing. Then all of a sudden it's like, call 911. Well, God, I, at this point they do, but at this point now, it's too late. Matthew was pronounced dead uh, approximately 27 minutes after arrival in the uh, emergency department. When we got there, they took me and Debbie in the back, and we were still hoping that when they pulled that sheet over his head, it was gonna be another kid, not yours. Just as bad as that sounds, there was just a chance it wasn't our son. And as soon as they pulled the sheet up and you seen his hairdo, you knew it was him. <laughs> I'm just screaming, no, not mad, not mad. The four ringleaders in the fraternity hazing and torture death of 21-year-old Chico State student Matthew Carrington accepted responsibility. All four, some through tears, pleading guilty. Guilty. Guilty, sir. Guilty. Guilty. All four were given jail time. Most culpable, 22-year-old Gabriel Maestretti, sentenced to a year in jail for involuntary manslaughter. 25-year-old Jerry Lim and 19-year-old John Fickus, sentenced to six months as accessories to manslaughter. Matt trusted him to, to help him out if he was going to get in trouble because he wasn't worried about getting into trouble with just drinking water. When it was time for help, they didn't step up and he didn't get any help. Nearly a year after Matthew's death, Debbie visits three of the four fraternity brothers who remain in jail, serving time for involuntary manslaughter. I don't think they're bad kids. I think they just made bad choices and have been a terrible, terrible mistake, you know, that we're all gonna live with for the rest of our lives. It's just too hard. I start all my days crying for Matt, because I just miss him so much. And I think of all of you guys. I think of the pain that you must be feeling having to live with that. For like the whole year, it was just one day being played over and over, that night being played over and over again in my head. I find it hard to forgive myself. I don't know, it's like the only thing that makes me feel better is to like hate myself. It's sad in of itself that you want, you want retribution just so it can be over with. What it's hard for us to realize is the power that situations have over us to cause us to act in certain ways. It was not the case that they had been horrible, moral failures. 
it's the case that they're like the rest of us, caught up in situations, influenced by the situations, reacting. I believe that there's all different kinds of people and that a certain kind of people take charge in situations. Unfortunately for Matt, none of us were the type of person who took charge and told people what to do. We just found ourselves looking at each other, waiting for someone to step up, and nobody did.